So it hurts the people it purports to help. Uh, among other things, it does that by, and this is my economic critique of the welfare state, uh, welfare states uh, suppress wealth creation, they suppress economic growth, um, they and I and and sadly I don't have I don't have the counterfactual parallel universe to prove this, but uh, to prove it empirically. But um, poor people would be far far better off without them, um, and uh, and so it it hurts them by basically giving them the false illusion and letting them live in a fantasy land that is everything is fine, everything's okay, when they could be living in a far better world. That requires a lot more of them, but actually provides them with far greater economic well-being. A good yeah. Intro. Yeah, we can kind of start on those lines. Um, so I guess to talk about some of that stuff, um, what I would say is that um, welfare, to me, has been proven to be fairly effective at alleviating uh, a great deal of extreme poverty in the world. Um, you mentioned that the thing that alleviates a lot of poverty um, isn't welfare, it's markets, you know, it's economic growth. Um, and to a large degree, I would agree. You know, I'm not a socialist, I'm a capitalist. I think the profit motive and market economics makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think that uh, within reason, though, uh, we can imagine a world that is made better uh, by distributing some of those gains to lower income people who need it uh, to the extent that you're incentivizing innovation um, and to some extent also bolstering innovation. You know, you mentioned that poor people would be much better off uh, without welfare because it uh, tra entraps them to some extent. You know, it allows them to uh, fall into the mindset of, of welfare uh, to where they don't need to innovate. They don't need to to strive. Um, but I would tell you that to me, it's the exact opposite, right? Um, I think that in a lot of countries with pretty robust welfare systems, um, we see the opposite. Um, because after all, it's pretty difficult to work on the next big technological innovation in your garage when you've got hunger and poverty looming over you the entire time, especially when you have to work another job or two in order to meet uh, you know, your needs. Um, rather, I think that, uh, at least in my view, welfare can provide a, uh, a bolstering effect on, on innovation for that reason. Um, you also mentioned that, you know, we don't have a counterfactual. Obviously, we don't have a world where there's no welfare, um, but we did have that world for a long time. You know, for a long time, the government didn't provide very much social welfare. Um, and that was a world with a lot more, uh, let's say, economic precariousness, a lot more poverty than we have today. Now, obviously, you could always ultimately say that the gains in poverty at those times were because of innovation, because of industrialization, because of economic growth. Um, and again, uh, we don't have any disagreements that economic growth can bring people out of poverty. Um, but uh, when we started to see uh, Social Security uh, and welfare programs come online uh, in response to like the Great Depression, for instance, we saw real increases in people's standard of living. Social Security has been one of the most successful anti-poverty programs of all time uh, that the U.S. has implemented uh, themselves. Uh, and I would say that in sort of the broader context of the world, uh, anti-poverty uh, and welfare programs have been shown to give real uh, increases in lower income people's standards of living. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, the countries with the most welfare um, or countries that we would perceive as having the most welfare, countries like Norway, Sweden, Iceland, you know, the Nordic countries broadly, um, that those countries also have some of the highest rates of social mobility, um, entrepreneurship, uh, and uh, income mobility in uh, the entire world. I don't, think, I don't think that that is a coincidence. Wow. Okay. So where do I start? Uh, that's a lot to unpack. And and it's it, it you know uh, uh, you're working off of um, a lot of uh, kind of mainstream conventional wisdom. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to spend time unpacking the uh, conventional Unpack wisdom. it, Yarn. Yeah. Unpack let's it. go. All right. I, let me just start by saying uh, so far we haven't talked about the moral aspects that I led off with. Um, you know, I, I hope we go back to that uh, because. Uh, Economics is uh, is interesting, but I don't think ultimately economics moves the world. I think it is morality, and I think that's why we have a welfare state for moral reasons. It has nothing to do with economics. But let me let me address the economic issues that you've raised so far. Let me start with the end. Let me start with the Scandinavian countries. Um, uh, Scandinavian ha countries have uh, high mobility only because uh, the gap between relative poor and relative wealth is small. So if you if you have a distribution that is very narrow, 
yes, it's easy to move across that distribution uh, very quickly. So it's meaningless to talk about mobility in Scandinavian countries and compare it to mobility in the U.S. What's much more interesting is to look at mobility in a country like the U.S., uh, uh, pre-welfare uh, state and post-welfare state, and mobility was far higher in the United States uh, before uh, the establishment of any welfare programs, including uh, Social Security in the 1930s, than it was, uh, was post-a uh, free market, a true free market, not relative welfare states, not one welfare state as compared to another. A true free market is the mo most mobile uh, because it is based on ability. It is not based on, on, um, on uh, uh, you know, uh, the fact is it based on on what you're able to do um you talked about uh the 19 the the uh the pre-welfare state uh world well let's take the pre-welfare state world uh in the 18th century 17th century uh, however far back we want to go uh, basically if you look at uh, western europe and the united states almost everybody was extremely poor uh as defined by the united nations two dollars a day or less the entire population was extremely poor, except for some aristocrats and, and maybe some city dwellers, some merchants in the city. Um, during a period where there was no welfare state for about 150 years, um, extreme poverty was basically, basically as extreme poverty as the UN defined it, eradicated in the West, in Western Europe and the United States. Just take a country like Sweden, uh, which is uh, one of everybody's favorite countries because it has a robust, or used to have a robust welfare state, less so today. Um, Sweden uh, was one of, was the poorest country in Europe in the uh, 1860s, 1870s. 1870, it liberated its economy, basically created the freest economy in Europe, one of the freest in the world, if not the freest at the time. Uh, from 1870 uh, uh, through World War II, uh, uh, Sweden basically grew at some of the fastest economic rates in, uh, in all of history. Basically, it eradicated extreme poverty in Sweden without any welfare. Uh, or with very, very little welfare in the 20s and 30s, uh, but, 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 but almost none. Uh, it then adopted uh, socialist policies of, of massive redistribution of wealth uh, in the 60s and 70s and, and through the 80s. And uh, by 1984, Sweden was basically bankrupt. Since then, it has been reforming its welfare state, shrinking the size of the welfare state. It's still big by U.S. standards. Um, but it's significantly less than what Denmark has, and it's significantly less than what it had in its past. Um, but most of that wealth that was being redistributed during those 60s, 70s, 80s was wealth that had been created during its period of free markets. Sweden went through a period when, um, in the 19th century, early 20th century, it had a significant number of the largest businesses in Europe were based in Sweden. Um, it was entrepreneurial. It was massively innovative. Um, it was, as I said, economic growth was robust. It then uh, got to a point where in the late 1970s, the two biggest industries in Sweden were ABBA, the uh, pop group, and uh, Johan Borg, the, the tennis player. So it had lost its leadership industrial-wise. It had lost its leadership uh, entrepreneur-wise. Uh, today, uh, it, it, entrepreneurship is back in Sweden, not in Denmark, not so much in Norway, not so much in Finland, but certainly in Sweden. And uh, if you look at that, it has very little, if anything, to do uh, with welfare because the welfare state has actually been shrinking from 1994 to today. But it has everything to do with the fact that Sweden has uh, very, very loose regulations. It's, it's reduced the regulatory burden on businesses significantly and, and uh, as a result made it much, much easier to start businesses and be an entrepreneur in Sweden than it had been in the past. Uh, but again, the, the, the real contrast, and uh, again, and, uh, you know, we can use social mobility. I forget the other two parameters that you use for the Scandinavian countries. Um, uh, but generally, if you look at Scandinavians, for example, um, Denmark, Sweden, if they were U.S. states, uh, in terms of GDP per capita adjusted for cost of living, would be well below the average of a U.S. state. They would be closer to uh, some of the poorest states in the South. The United States is significantly richer than on a on a GDP per capita basis um, than uh, Scandinavia is. Americans live in bigger homes, they drive bigger cars, they 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 have more money uh, to spend and to save. Uh, and uh, if if you look at uh, life expectancy, people always bring this up. Uh, life expectancy of Swedes in the U in the United States is about the same as life expectancy of Swedes in Sweden. 
um, as is um, all, uh, as all measures of happiness. So um, there's nothing special about Scandinavia. It's a nice place to live relative to what we have today in the world. Um, but it's also a pretty dull place to live in a sense that there's little ambition, um, particularly in a place like Denmark or even more so in Norway. Uh, uh, productivity is, is not increased as much as it has in other places, certainly not as much as it could in a free market. Entrepreneurship is nowhere near the potential. Israel is more uh, entrepreneurial than, than, than uh, most Scandinavian countries. Um, there's just nothing to write home about. And then France, of course, which spends on welfare about as much as Scandinavia does, um, you don't get any of the so-called pluses that the Scandinavian countries seem to have. Uh, maybe because France is bigger, less homogeneous, and, and is more similar in that sense to the United States. Or maybe if you take away some of the factors that make Scandinavia unique, you don't get some of the supposed benefits that everybody sees in Scandinavia. So no, I, I think extreme poverty was eradicated in the West by capitalism, by free markets. The welfare state has basically um, taken all the wealth that was created during that time and spent it uh, and spends much of that wealth. And in the process, it has dramatically slowed economic growth. Uh, poverty in the United States, relative poverty, not absolute poverty, of course, but relative poverty in the United States has not decreased since the 1970s. Um, it, it, uh, it was decreasing uh, fast before the war on poverty started. It continued to decrease in the beginning of the war on poverty and since then has been flat. Poor people in the United States, social mobility in the United States has been hurt, in my view, by the welfare state. Social mobility has shrunk because of the welfare state. Um, and, um, you know, economic growth is pathetic and has been pathetic since uh, the beginning, since the 1970s, since we started this uh, large uh, experiment in massive redistributions of wealth. And we can talk about Social Security. I've spoken for a long time, so let me put aside Social Security. Uh, I, I disagree with you completely about Social Security. I think Social Security has, has been an a, a unmitigated uh, disaster and is going to be even worse in the future, but it's basically harmed Americans, both because it reduces economic growth and because um, irresponsible people retire on less money. And what, we, what Social Security does I'm just talking about it anyway. What Social Security does is reward irresponsibility and penalize responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content. And of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are ready subscribers and those of you who are ready supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.